friendship and affection I need To feel my father smiling at me
My, uh, my wife Stacy is reading this book right now. It's the book that's going to be in. Uh, there's a small group starting for for women, and uh, she just Stacy reminded me last night how blessed we are. And, you know, our, our God is healer. Our God is stronger than any other, and just how blessed we are. Not only where we live in our country, but just the fact that we live in this great country and we have all these blessings. And, and Stacy said something like, "90 percent of the world lives." struggle sometimes, but really compared to, to the world, we're, we're so blessed that it's, it's just hard for us to comprehend what most of the rest of the world is going through. time for us to pray together so what are the prayers who are the the people what are the situations that we've been thinking about this week those that we want to invite others in on to join us in prayer mark yes jack and jerry and 
both have people here. Lois is back here. and Jer- Jerry's uh, not often in the service, but his, his wife is the greeter um, that often greets us as we come in. And he has been profoundly ill this week. I mean, he, he's been on a respirator, a ventilator, um, and uh, um, just very, very ill, septic with infection. So let's keep Jerry in our prayers, if we would. Judy's the greeter person. That's, her, that's his wife. So, Who else do we hold up? Yeah. Who is it? I just heard Jeremiah went to the hospital this morning. He's so sick. He's, uh, he, he's got fever, and he's been on several antibiotics, I think already a couple of them, and so I don't think they know quite what to do, so let's get him in where he's going to be watched. Thanks. Yeah. Potter did. Let's remember Potter. Is he back in school yet? Oh, good. Good, good, good. Well, I'm glad to hear that can be a really, really hard thing. So thanks for sharing. Who else are we praying for? Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, let's keep that in our prayers as they're dealing with helping these kids and giving them this connection with these animals. Thanks for sharing. Who else are we praying for? Yeah. Oh, Katie, congratulations. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so special. And you know, when we talk about it openly, like you are. All of a sudden, we realize how many people share that with you that we never knew. And that's really special. Oh, great. What other prayers do we hold up today? You know, we've had a lot of people sick. Mark, you're here. You've been, you've been really wrestling with awful sickness. My wife, Gail, has too. She uh, two weeks ago started with headaches and then on into fever, 102 all week or most of the week. Um, and so she's uh, been the last couple of days coming down and just a couple of minutes ago I got a text. I won't tell you all her texts, but I'll share this one with you. It says woke up without a fever which is really 99 degrees. So it's itty bitty, but it's not bad. And uh, all the kids it was a group text to the kids and so they're all kind of whooping it up except Matt's still asleep. So, But everybody else is, is with her. So that's I mean great news and as you know, Gail has patients that are, and they're scheduled out. Full, she's got a full schedule for two months without any openings. And so all week they were having to tell her patients, she's not coming in. You're going to have to, um, we're going to have to reschedule. But when you reschedule, when you're that far out, I don't know. So it's been a very difficult thing. So thank you for those of you that have been keeping Gail in your prayers this week. I appreciate it. Anybody else we're holding up? Anybody else we're thinking about? Yeah, yeah. remember when she had some other things, yeah. Oh, good surgery. All right. Glad to hear about that, you guys. Great. Any other people? Yes, Mark. Yeah, for Oliver. Oliver is my, I want you to meet Oliver. Oliver, stand up. Oliver is my exchange son from Germany from 10 years ago. We met each other. Oliver trained me in the art of being an exchange father. And so Oliver's been here to visit several times. He's forgiven me for the years of difficulty. But um, he's, he's here with us this week and uh, actually goes home today. He'll be in London in a few hours, which is hard to even imagine. But um, I, Oliver, just 
the time we get together is so valuable for me. So I want you to know my other family. And uh, so thanks for, and greet him after the service. He does speak better English than me. So you'll <laughs> kind of enjoy the conversation. Yay. <laughs> Any, anybody else? Hey, there is a neat thing that I'm celebrating. And it's not, I mean, it, does, it took the snowstorm or whatever snowstorm we had to do it, but this is the first Sunday in the last year and a half that since we've started this service that there are more people in service two than in service one. You know, it's just <laughs> and isn't that just so cool? I mean, I, I mean, the older folks and they had to get up early, and the snow is still a question mark. And although the guys pushing the snow around this morning were past my house, you know five o'clock or something, maybe yours as well. So they were just working hard and doing good work early. But I am so thrilled. I don't I don't mean we ever want to play these services off against each other because they're for they're for all for different things. And you guys may find yourself coming to that other service when this slot doesn't work for a travel reason or something else. But I just want us all to find that there's value in everything we do and um so celebrate is cool. That's really great. Other things we're praying about or celebrating? Yeah. Yeah, Tim's up here. Yeah, yay. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Now, it, all our drummers don't end up moving to Traverse City. I just want you to know that. So even though you might like Traverse. Yeah, so far, all of them have. But <laughs> I love that. Oh dear, <laughs> what else are we? Yes. Your grandmother, and what is her first name? Phyllis. Let's keep Phyllis in our prayers this week. Stage four cancer. Okay, stage four. Keep Phyllis in our prayers. Anybody else that we're holding up today? Others that we are remembering? There's so many situations around our world, aren't there? Very troubling things that sometimes we don't even like to spend time talking about it. The news gets overwhelming for me sometimes to hear. And yet, I think that there are, are ways when we work hard to make where we are a better place, it has repercussions. And so let's continue to pray for situations that are even a long ways away, that somehow... Um, the kingdom of God will break through here and there and, and, and everywhere. Anything else? Let's come together in prayer. Great God, we come to this place. We bring ourselves just as we are. And we know that you, you love us completely, fully. Even before we make any shift or change or decision or do anything really that great, love us. And Lord, that means so much. And so as we gather with others, we know that though our voice doesn't need to be strong, it gets strengthened through this unity of purpose and spirit. Lord, help us as we read your word today and as we proclaim it among ourselves, that it won't be just something that stays here, but that your truth will resonate throughout our community and beyond. Lord, we thank you for the other churches in our neighborhood, the churches that are throughout this community, this, this county, and we ask for you to just bring wonderful strength that as each of us come together here, all of our churches in one sense will be together under your care. And you'll change this place. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen.
on down, you guys. Let's see if uh, Stanley shows up. We didn't have our box show up at the last service, but maybe Stanley will show up in this one. Stanley. It's gone. <gasps> no, nope, Stanley is coming. All right. Let's see what we got today. Okay, kind of heavy. You guys doing okay? Doing good? All right. Let's see what we've got. Oh, I don't know. Oh, maybe I kind of know. This is your pad, right? And what do you use it for? Playing games? Yeah? Can you turn it on so we can see how it looks? Oh, it's got like a... Did you have it on this page for a reason? This is... Is this a... Tell me what it's doing. Is it showing us like this is like a, an app store or something where you can get apps? Showing us the time. Oh, now we got a game. All right, what game is what game is this? What's it called though? Oh, okay. Well, I don't know this game. Do I do it this way? Oh, I can look at other games too, right? These are all the games you have. Oh, these are cool. What's your favorite? Do you have a, you don't have a favorite? Well, I'm just looking here. Oh, what are these guys? Veggie Tales. That's pretty cool. I better turn it off though, because I'll get. Oh, you push play. Now, how many of you guys have a pad, or you have access to one, or a phone, or something like this? Does anybody have access to games like this? Pretty much everybody has access to something like this somewhere, huh? You know, these are pretty special. And they're, I consider them, believe it or not, I consider a pad like this a tool that helps us to accomplish the important things in our lives. What kind of things can you do with a pad other than play games? Can you think of anything else you can do or with a phone or with, what can you do? Okay, you could watch a video, right? Exactly. That's a that's another good idea. And then it's a matter of which video you're watching because you could watch really great ones that are meaningful or maybe teach us something or you could watch something that's just kind of fluff and it doesn't help us and it doesn't inspire us or anything. So it really matters what kind of movies we watch sometimes. What are you thinking? We can do our homework on it. Oh, you can do your homework. You were you know you're talking to a parent here and uh yep, that would be good. And Again, homework would be a really useful way of using this tool, you know, doing something like that. What else would be, what's that? Aha, you can FaceTime with a phone or a pad or something like this too. So this tool has many different uses. And, you know, that's important. Now, there's one thing that you can do with this that... that that is on mind. You ever notice sometimes we do, like for instance, what are you going to do in a couple of minutes? You're going to read what? You're going to read the Bible. So this, believe it or not, can even be a Bible. And that's another way that it can be an important tool in our lives. It gets down to the point where we realize that it's really not just um, a pad. It is whatever we make it to be. And in some cases, we can use it in very, very helpful ways. And other ways we can use it aren't helpful really at all. And so today, as we gather in this place, we can think about other tools in our lives, like this space. This is a place we call a what? What is a church, exactly. And this church is a building like any other building. But what happens here, we pray and hope and we make efforts to see that what happens here is valuable and good. It is a wonderful tool that can make our community and our lives and our church family a better place for us to be. And so this is a great choice today by bringing your pad and showing us what you do with it. And, you know, this is an important thing, Cole, so I appreciate you bringing it. So I'm going to put it right back in here, and we're going to have a prayer today, okay? You ready to pray? Let's say a prayer. Lord, um, for these kids. And for all they mean in our lives, for the ways in which they inspire us and encourage us and, and just like bring love into places that sometimes would be pretty quiet and pretty boring. 
Lord, you have blessed us again and again and again. Thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, Nicole, here you go. It's all yours, buddy. Well, just a couple of announcements to share with you real quick. Uh, if you grabbed a bulletin on the way in, you may have seen a couple of these. And the, the two that I want to highlight to you out of there, Matt's already kind of alluded to one of them. Uh, it, it's got to do with our small group. And you know that at different times, those of you that have been here with us for a while, you know that as a church, sometimes we do lots of them all at the same time, studying the same thing. That is not at all what these are. There's two in your book, or in your bulletin. Uh, one is for uh, young ladies. Uh, or I don't know that there's an age limit on it necessarily. So if you think you're young, probably, I'm guessing. <laughs> um, it's going to be meeting on Sunday nights at 8 o'clock. There are books in the back for you to grab if you want to be a part of that. It's going to be at Stacey Vandervelde's house. And uh, I don't know where Matt's going because I'm guessing he's not allowed to be there. So anyway, but uh, maybe you can welcome Matt into your home during that time. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so, so that's for some of the women of our church to come together and just look at Look at Christian life and look at, look at what life means to them. So, And the other one is on Thursday evenings. It's run by uh, the tenants kind of take care of that one. Uh, it's a Bible study type thing, and that's also advertised in there. So if you're interested in coming in, maybe digging a little deeper with some of the biblical studies, uh, that would be another good place to come together and just to try to go a little deeper into what it means to do church, what it means to be part of the body of Christ. So thank you for stepping up and leading that. And, and let that. I guess the other piece of that is that that was kind of, Stacy's idea to sort of jump in and do that. I don't think any of us, you know, beat her into doing it or anything. So if God's laying on your heart that, that you'd like to start something like that, speak to myself or to Pastor Phil or to Matt, and we'll, you know, try to get something put together uh, that can be meaningful for the life of our church. And with that, because when we do things like that, we want to try to get in touch with each other. We want to be able to contact each other and, and get the word out about things. So in your bulletin, does everybody have a bulletin? Does everybody get one on the way in? Okay, in there, there is something called a Connect card, and I should have grabbed a bulletin, but anyway, Wendy puts that in there for us. Wendy's our church secretary. It's perforated, um, and so what I'm going to ask today, because we don't focus on this a lot, is that, that's a good way for folks that are new with us to put information in there. It's also a good way if you have to update something, but my ask this morning is, if you're here in our presence, fill one of those out and drop it in the, the offering plate, just so that we're sure that as we start out this new year, we've got correct information for you that things are up to date so that if we're trying to get in touch with each other, uh, we're able to do that. So, And if you're ever here and you see a visitor that's here with us, reach over, make sure they know how to do that, know where that is so that we can reach out to them and make sure that, that we're meeting their needs and uh, connecting with them as a church. I think you missed some scripture for us this morning. This morning our scripture starts out in the book of Luke, and then we are going to uh, the book of Luke chapter 3. And we're going to then read part and then jump on ahead by a few verses. So starting with chapter 3, verse 15. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And then jumping ahead to to Luke chapter 3, verse 21, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he was praying, and as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. This Sunday uh, is a Sunday that comes around the cycle of readings uh, every year. It's called the Baptism of Our Lord Sunday. It's a time for us to reflect a bit on the meaning of baptism and the purpose for it in our lives. And gosh, every year people at various times will ask me this question or that. There are so many things that surround the meaning of baptism. So today is a day when we typically take a little time and talk about baptism. Now, I don't want this to be a time when, when um, you uh, think this is the only time that questions can be raised or asked, but we'll talk about questions here today and we'll talk about some other times. Today, I just want to share a few things that will kind of put a little context to baptism. 
it's, it's always been at the heart of the Christian faith. It's, it's kind of like a sign, a, a symbol that a person belongs to God. It's been a symbol for even longer than the Christian church has been around. The Jewish people before the Christians would see it as, as a symbol of purification. We see it as a symbol of adoption, which is a great celebration for today. Adopted into the family of God, in a sense. It's a, a symbol of naming. It's a symbol of membership. It's what the church has called, you may have heard, a sacrament. It's what the church has called a means of grace. It's what the church has referred to as a holy moment or a moment of commitment. Maybe today we can consider some of these aspects. As you can already tell, there's, there's so many things that could be said and all of our questions are valuable and, and worth asking. So let's continue to ask questions. You might remember last August, I spent quite a bit of time talking about various issues around membership and baptism. And we'll do that some more again. Don't worry. I want to start with a story that happened a long time ago. There was a mountain preacher who was baptizing converts at a revival meeting uh, when up stepped a burly old guy that uh, said he wanted to be baptized along with everyone else. And so the preacher began to lead him off into the water. And as he did this, uh, there was another man standing there who was watching quietly. And, and he remarked, he said, Preacher, I don't want to interfere in what you're doing, but uh, you need to know that this is no ordinary sinner you have there. Um, and that one dip surely will, will not be enough. I'd say you better take him out and anchor him in deep water all night long. And I think, in a sense, you know, as we hear something like that, this objector was kind of right. If, if our hope for cleansing is based on the efforts of the water, there's going to have to be a whole lot more water to clean us up. Because our lives really do have a lot of aspects to them that are far from perfect. We know that it's not the water of baptism that saves us. Water is a symbol of something beyond itself. Water has no soul-saving power in and of itself. And to be frank, this is the tougher one. Contrary to a long and strong strain of Christian thinking, neither does the sturdiness of our belief. The focus in baptism isn't on the believer, however much we want to make it that way. But the focus is on God. Grace isn't something we earn by the goodness of our lives or by the correctness of our beliefs, but something we receive as a free gift. That's a hard thing for us to hear. Baptism is intended to symbolize this. Yes, you know, there's a connectedness um, with our turning from sin, we often hear that associated with baptism and other moments of commitment in the church. But I'll tell you, the older I get, the longer I'm alive on this planet, the more I'm reminded that even in our repentance, we fall far short of what our souls really need. Take, for example, the powerful story of the prodigal son. I think a lot of us have heard that, and if not, we're going to be touching on that one down the road a little ways. Now in this parable, there's a wayward son and, and he goes off and, and, and lives his life in, in ways that are not good for him, not good for anybody. Eventually he sees the problems with his life and in the, mo in the midst of that he turns. Um, and the word repent is used in the midst of that particular translation and story and he heads for home. However, even then, as he's turning and heading home, he misunderstands the full extent of his father's love in this parable of Jesus. This young man goes home with the intention of living his life as a servant in his father's house. Remember, he doesn't want to go home as a son. He wants to go home as something far less than what his father had intended for him to be. This is what he says in that story. He says, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you, Father. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, in response, said, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and let's celebrate. For this son of mine, who is dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found. So 
so tempting for us to think that that we are the agents of our own salvation. That somehow we just got to get our lives perfectly in line with what it is that needs to happen and then everything will be all right. But even in our best moments, when we turn away from our failings and do the best we can possibly do, we still have profound shortcomings. Have you ever noticed that about our lives? That we talk about sometimes, there, a lot of us as Christians would like to have this thing work a lot cleaner. We'd love it if maybe our lives were kind of goofed up and then all of a sudden we, we see the light and we come and we receive baptism and then everything's perfect after that, right? We've all seen it and experienced it in ourselves enough to know somehow it doesn't work that way. And we know that even after something profound and wonderful, deeply spiritual can happen in our lives, really awful things can come of our choices even after that moment. And we can goof up ourselves and other people. And that's not what God intends for us. And today I want to talk more about that. I, I want us to be reminded of some of the, the, the rock bottom truths that are present here. Now our humility would serve us well if we would just realize that we, we are imperfect, all of us, before, during, and after our baptism. The good news is that God loves us and accepts us anyway that's the good news god meets us where we are we might say even while we are still a long way off that's part of the prodigal story while the son is still a long way off and he's coming home the father sees him and runs to him and that's wonderful news because he wasn't coming home with all the right intentions but his father was so so just glad that there was any progress at all. So the salvation that we celebrate when we discuss baptism isn't a victory of our own will, but a victory of a loving God, our loving God. God so loves us that all of our human antics don't dissuade or repulse God. That's why we, we always come to baptism as an act of humility. Baptism is a symbol of God loving us so completely, God's free gift of grace. That's something for us to see today. In Vienna, Austria, there's a, a church in which the Habsburgs, the, the former ruling family of Austria, they're all buried in this one church underneath, you know, down in the chambers underneath the sanctuary. It's said that when royal members of the family, when there was a royal funeral, somebody died, they, they would finally arrive at the church for the burial rites, and the mourners leading the funeral procession would knock on these big doors of this church at the entrance. And there would be then, after their knock, there would be a question. Who is it that desires admission here? And a priest would ask through the locked door. His apostolic majesty, the emperor, would reply the guard of the procession at the funeral. And the person on the inside would then say, I don't know him. A second knock would then follow. And this happened with each emperor as they died. And that second knock would come, similar to the first, and a response very similar, who comes there. And this time the response would be, the highest emperor. Again, the response, I don't know him, would echo through the chambers, the burial chambers underneath the cathedral. Finally, a third knock would be heard. Who is it? And the response would be, a poor sinner, your brother. And then the door would open. And the burial rites would continue for the king. I think that's the proper attitude that we would all come before the rites of baptism and what this is all about. Understanding which the things that place us not as entitled, not as above others, but as sisters and brothers, even to those whom we disagree with. In God's sight, you see we're all equal. We're all part of a family, the same family, all of us. It's not the water that saves us. It's not our own noble lives if we feel we have them. It's not all our great intentions that save us. 
It's God acting out of total and complete self-giving love. That's the first thing that we need to see today. It's God who saves us. Here's the second thing I want you to see today. It's also God who calls us. As we've stated, baptism is a free gift from God. But the purpose of baptism is to give us a new identity so we understand ourselves differently than we might otherwise see who we are. William Barker tells about a machinist with the Ford Motor Company back in the days of Ford himself. I, I've not shared this broadly, but my great-grandfather worked for, uh, for uh, Ford. He was the engineer that developed um, one of the early engines that went in the cars. It was prior to Ford. Ford would buy the company that he was a part of. But um, there were a lot of things that went on in the early years of the Ford Motor Company. You know, it got big really fast. And as it got larger, people would begin to pill for tools and parts and stuff. And it became a big problem, but nothing that the people really knew how to address. And so people would take stuff home all the time. It seems that there was one machinist in that time where the machinist uh, had taken a lot of things home, but he had then had some type of an experience of faith, and he became baptized. The next day he went to work, and with him he brought scoodles of tools and parts. He really took his baptism seriously. He decided that there was something different about him, something that wasn't going to be the same. When he arrived, he tried to explain to his foreman that he never really meant to steal the stuff, but he hoped that he'd be forgiven. And the foreman, he was kind of blown away, and, and, and he was impressed by this man's actions, and, and he tabled uh, Henry Ford himself, who was visiting a plant in, in Europe at the time, and he explained the entire event in detail. Immediately, Ford cabled back, and this is what Ford said. Dam up the Detroit River and baptize the entire city, he said. <laughs> he was hoping to get a lot of tools back, I think. <laughs> you know, baptism can work kind of that way by maybe opening our eyes to our true identity. It's not that at the moment that you pass through the waters of baptism, everything will finally occur to you. It's a symbol that things can occur to us, that our eyes can be opened. And as we begin to realize who we are, children of God, we stand a better chance of living our lives more closely aligned with what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ. Not just followers of what Phil wants or you know what Nick wants. It's, it's followers of this core figure. You know, we believe in God. Through Christ, Jesus' way becomes the way that teaches us who God really is. And we become his followers, bearers of Jesus' name, Christians. In a sense, as we are adopted into the family, we take on a new name. We take on the name Christian as a part of our name. That's part of what baptism can remind us of. About 20 years ago, there was a Wall Street Journal article that carried an uh, um, uh, interview um, with someone who was from Turkey at the time. It's actually 22 years ago. Some of you may realize Turkey wasn't, uh, it was often a, a secular country that didn't have a lot of religious stuff kind of wrapped up in what was going on with the people. And the it, it was beginning to tilt towards a more fundal, fundamentalist kind of point of view for a lot of people during that time period. And this particular article in, in the journal reported and gave uh, an interview with this young um, Muslim Turk. This is what he said. I find it really telling, particularly in light of today's news and, and the things that are happening. He said, our view of religion, our view, he was talking about himself, is different from yours. And he said this to a Western visitor. According to your rules, he continued, religion counts only in the place where you pray. Our religion is a way of life. I have no time at all, not one minute, without Islam. Oh my goodness. Is that the way some of the world, or maybe much of the world, views the Christian faith? Our rules apply for us only while we're, like, in church. Sadly, I have to say, I'm afraid that this has all too often truly characterized our actual practice of faith. Many people would be hard-pressed to, to, 
to know maybe that we're Christians, they, to know about our faith, to know what it is we believe. You know, and it isn't about us pushing our faith on someone, but to be living in such a way that our faith is evident to the world. And we might be able to paraphrase with this young man, we have no time at all, we could say. Not one minute about God. That's what our baptism symbolizes, that we step into a new realization that we realize that there isn't any time that we are separate from God because God is a part of our lives, not just an hour on Sunday morning. I like what what a pastor once reflected on when he was visiting um, his home in Germany where he was born. He went back to visit and and he went to, the, to not only the community, but he went into the church where he had been baptized. And he went there and stood in the sanctuary and there was a baptismal font and it was a, a very old font. And he stood there and he reflected deeply. He thought of the gratitude that he had for all he had received in that church from his parents, from the other people of the church, and indeed from God. He was thinking about renewal in his own life, and he was thinking about rededication of his calling as a disciple, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ. And he thought about it as he stood there, that it began right there in that font with his baptism, symbolically. The church was, it was an ancient church. Generations had been there before him. And it received this gift that he's thinking about right now, this gift of caring family and church family and God caring for him and loving him through a lifetime of faith. And as he stood there taking it all in and the vaulted ceiling over the top of him and the beauty of this place, he got to asking himself the question, how could I possibly ever be faithless in light of everything that was given to me, this great gift? I wonder how many of us, in a sense, walk away from the baptismal font and do little or nothing with God's call in our lives. You know, as God calls us, there's a purpose behind that call. We are here for a reason, all of us. And God has a great plan for our lives, something bigger than ourselves individually, bigger than we could ever plan bigger than we could devise. God has a plan. Are we willing to walk in those steps that God has called us into? Sometimes it's hard to imagine, but, but God really does want each of us to walk in Jesus' footsteps in some fashion. Baptism signifies, first remember, that it is God who has saved us. And baptism signifies that it is God who has called us. And finally, baptism reminds us that it is also God who goes with us. Jesus, uh, um, just as we don't come to baptism trusting in ourselves and our own merits, but in God's great love for us, baptism is also a reminder that we're not alone in the world. That as we go out into the world, we don't go there by ourselves. As Jesus heard these words at his baptism, you know, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So we too can hear similar words, that God loves us. We are God's children and God totally, totally embraces who we are. Everyone in the small town called her Grandma Richardson. Late one afternoon, Grandma Richardson, she looked out her window to see a group of men stepping up on her porch. It was a familiar sight in this coal town. She knew what had happened before they even told her. Her husband had been killed in the, a mining accident. Years after that incident would pass slowly, and 
with great difficulty. Grandma Richardson was admired by everyone in town for her courage and her unwavering faith. She and her children attended church most every week and she just lived with such a grace in, in, in everything she did. Then there was another knock on her door. Her older son had been killed in another mine accident. Grandma knew that this was the way of life. She grew older and she grew weaker. In the spring and the summer, when, when the weather was warm, she'd sit on her front porch in her rocking chair, slowly rocking, softly singing those, those hymns that she'd memorized from her childhood. The children, they'd gather around her there as she sat in her chair, and they'd listen to her sing, and they'd join in, and, and they would listen to her tell Bible stories and stories of her faith. Believe it or not, it happened again. Another son was killed in the mine. After the funeral, Grandma Richardson was sitting again on her porch in her favorite chair, singing when one of the children looked up and said, Grandma, aren't you sad today? She replied, yes. I'm sad. I, I'm very sad. It's hard to say goodbye to someone you love. And I've had to do it now three times. But I have something more than sadness inside of me. And then she spoke to those children about her faith. And as she shared, one of the little ones interrupted her and said, Grandma, can you give us some of that faith? And she said, why, my child, I've been giving it to you now for years. It's knowing that, that God loves you and that I love you and that God has made a gigantic promise that is a gift. And it's perhaps the greatest gift in all the world, God promised that no matter what happens, no matter how good or bad things may be, regardless of your joy or your sorrow, God will not leave you alone. Remember that, child. You know, I think that's God's promise to each of us. It goes part and parcel with our baptism understand that baptism symbolizes our becoming new persons and it symbolizes that it is God that saves us and that baptism reminds us that we are called into a new life of grace-filled service to the world. We're not just here about ourselves and that baptism also symbolizes that it's God who goes with us into that world. As spooky and scary as it sometimes gets, that my friends is good news. We are God's beloved children. And God goes with us. And he is well pleased with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we gather here today, um, as we've gathered and we've, we've shared this a year ago, um, I'd like to invite you to come forward if you would like as a symbol of, of recognition. Now, some of you may remember your baptism. Some of you, it may have been something that happened when you were so young you don't possibly remember it. And that's okay too. But the idea of remembering our baptism is an idea that says, I have a deep appreciation for what my baptism means in my life. I'm going to invite everyone that wants to come forward. You don't have to come forward. It's, it's something that you are welcome to come forward and be a part of and receive the sign of the cross on your forehead as I say, remember your baptism and be thankful. I do not personally remember mine. Mine happened on my parents' 10th wedding anniversary when I was six months old. But that story has been told to me many times. And the circumstances surrounding it and my church family and my family mean a great deal to me. 
So in one sense, I remember my baptism, and I'm grateful for it. If you're here today and you have not been baptized, but you would, you would like to be baptized, we can do that today. You don't have to do it today. You can tell me and we can do it another day when we can plan for it. But I want you to know if you've got an inclination to be baptized today, come forward like the others, but just step off to the side. And Nick will kind of get some information quickly, and we will do that there now. But I want to invite you to come forward to remember your baptism and be grateful for it. Feel free to step forward and receive the water on your forehead as a reminder of your baptism. Remember and be thankful. The waters of baptism. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Stacy, remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Nick, remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. 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 Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. 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 Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. The waters of baptism. Remember them and be thankful. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join us.
Hey, Man. you guys, just be seated for just one moment. Uh, Katie missed out earlier when we were doing this, and some of you know my story of baptism. My parents were embarrassed on the day I got baptized. Or it was their 10th anniversary, and they tried to come in after the service and ask pastor to baptize me, and the pastor went out in the parking lot and got everybody back in the building so I could be baptized. My mother was mortified then, you know. You'll hear the full story someday, but Katie missed it. So I want to bring you up here, Katie, and have you remember your baptism. And uh, what I do is I'm just getting a little water on my fingers, and I'm going to make like a sign of a cross on your forehead, and I'm going to do you, and then I want you to do me. Would you do me? Because nobody did me, okay? Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. And you, you have special, special family to remember that with. Would you do me? Just put your finger in there and then do my forehead and tell me, remember your baptism and be thankful. Thank you, Katie. Amen. Let's go in peace. Amen. I'm